and welcome to Toronto Zoo's Big, Bad and Ugly Asian Carp Exhibit. My name is Mary Kate and I'm the Great Lakes Program Coordinator here at the Toronto Zoo. So like I said, we're here at our Asian Carp Exhibit. Uh, it was officially opened in 2018 and it was a partnership between many different organizations including Invasive Species Center, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So ourselves, we work with these partners and many others to help bring this exhibit to life, to bring live Asian carps here for people to see, and also to bring lots of information about these animals. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about Asian carps, a little bit about their biology, and we're going to talk a little bit about them as invasive species in North America and specifically in the Great Lakes region. So let's start by talking a little bit about these species that we call Asian carps. So we come over here. So we have a graphic here of the four species of Asian carp. So it's this group of four different fish species that we refer to as Asian carp. We have black carp, big head carp, grass carp, and silver carp. Now here in our exhibit, we have three of these four species. So we do not actually have silver carp here in the exhibit. And the reason for that has to do with a particular behavior that they exhibit. So these silver carp are actually well known for exhibiting a jumping behavior. But it's not just jumping, it's a very furious jumping. Uh, so you might have seen these uh, videos online or maybe in the news or on TV. Uh, but if you did, then you would have seen silver carp. When they are startled by a boat passing through the water, they will all start to jump out of the water. And in these videos, you might see people actually can get hit by them on boats. Um, and they're pretty big fish, so that can cause a lot of problems. So we don't have silver carp in the exhibit for that reason. And also because of this jumping behavior that they do, it makes it very hard to transport them. So they could possibly get injured in transportation if they were to jump and you know hit something. So let's walk over to the exhibit. We'll take a look at the live fish and I'll uh, keep keep telling you a little bit about them. So the Asian carps are a member of the Cyprinid family, also known as minnows. Now a lot of times when we think of minnows, we think of really tiny little fish, right? Maybe only a couple inches long. But some members of this family can actually get quite big. And I'll come over here for reference. The big head carp as an adult gets to be this big, right here. So they can be four to five feet in length uh, when they're full size and the, the black carp as well and grass carp can get very big. So all four species can get quite big. So uh, it's, they are part of the middle family, but they are not, they are not small fish. Uh, the middle family is also a very diverse group of fishes and actually the largest group of fishes in the world. So Asian carps are from Southeast Asia, that's the area that they are native to in the world. And within that ecosystem, they are they're part of that ecosystem naturally. So they don't cause the problems there that we see here as an introduced species. So currently we do not have Asian carp species established in the Great Lakes region. There are no populations of them. There have been isolated incidents where individual uh, Asian carps, uh, in particular grass carp, have been caught. But most of those species, uh, most of those individuals were sterile and we weren't seeing an actual population that was reproducing. So we don't have them established in the Great Lakes, which is a good thing, uh, but there's a lot of work being done to prevent them from entering into the Great Lakes ecosystem. And I'll get to that in a little bit, but first I'll talk a little bit about their biology and why that makes them problematic in the Great Lakes ecosystem. So Asian carps are known for eating a lot. They can eat 40% of their body weight in a day, and some species can eat constantly, just nonstop. And this is why they were introduced into aquaculture ponds in the United States in the 1970s. So the, the people that introduced them knew about this behavior and they used it to help keep aquaculture facilities clean of algae and other types of microorganisms and organisms. 
But the problem was that these Asian carp were able to escape, and they started to move into the natural ecosystem around it, and they started to move north in the Mississippi River in particular. So they started to swim north, and then what happened was, whenever there was a flooding event, so really, really heavy rain that caused flooding, that could potentially uh, create a connection between two water bodies that were not connected before, that really helped the Asian carp spread from one water body to another, and that allowed them to, to spread around. So they were moving closer to the Great Lakes, and in particular, Lake Michigan, which is the only of the only one of the five Great Lakes to be entirely in the United States. So fortunately, they've not gotten much further into the Great Lakes. Beyond that, there are electric barriers set up in the Chicago waterway that should prevent them from moving into the Great Lakes. Uh, and there's also a lot of um, surveys that are done. So uh, different organizations that go out and look for Asian carp and a lot of water testing. In particular, for something called eDNA or environmental DNA. And that's something that's done here in Canada as well to test for these, uh, for these fishes, for the presence of these fishes. So actually, interestingly, that was a key component of designing this exhibit, is that we had to consider that any wastewater from this exhibit, like from cleaning it, if it got into the, um, the waterway, that that could potentially lead to a false positive for environmental DNA uh, detection of Asian carp. So we had to design this exhibit so that no wastewater could leave this area without being treated first. And that would break down the environmental DNA and prevent it from getting into the natural water system and, and possibly being detected by those crews who are out looking for it. So it is a very quarantined system that we have here. And in fact, when the Asian carp arrived at the Toronto Zoo, uh, they actually spent double the amount of time in quarantine uh, that most species uh, would. So normally it's a 30 day quarantine period, but for our Asian carp, they have uh, a minimum of 60 day quarantine before they uh, they arrived here in this exhibit. So they were in our health unit in a special restricted area before they were brought here. And this is because Asian carps are a highly regulated species in Canada. It is illegal to possess them or transport them, whether they are alive or dead, unless they are eviscerated. So Asian carps are actually able to survive out of water for longer periods of time. Uh, and that's why they have to be eviscerated. Uh, so that means they have no internal organs uh, to ensure that they are in fact dead. So we were able to obtain special permission uh, for educational purposes to, to have these uh, live fish here in our exhibit. Um, but they are otherwise a very prohibited species here in Canada. And as I mentioned, uh, that's because they are considered an invasive species. And that has to do with that feeding behavior, the fact that they eat so much. That's part of it. Uh, they could get into our natural ecosystems here in the Great Lakes, and they could uh, potentially eat so much food and create competition for our native species. So here, they're in a tank with other species from the Southeast Asia region. That's, we call it a community tank. Um, but here in, in our lakes and waterways of the Great Lakes uh, would not be that case. So they could present that competition for food and space as I mentioned, these fish are very big. They're very big when they're adult size. And just by a factor of their size, they can create a lot of problems in ha with habitat. Just from swimming around, they can stir up all the dirt in the bottom of the waterway. And they can actually cause vegetation to become uprooted, changing the water quality and creating problems for our native species. They might not want to use that habitat anymore if it's been dis disturbed by Asian carp. But the Asian carp would also use the same space to lay their eggs and, and feed. So it would essentially create this competition and could result in the decline of our native species. And beyond that, we also share the water with our native species. We use it for boating and fishing and swimming. And if we had these large fish uh, creating uh, decreased water quality, that could result in us not being able to use the water for all these different recreational purposes as well. 
So this is why uh, Asian carp are considered to be a pretty big threat and a lot of work is being done to prevent their entry into Canadian waterways and the Great Lakes ecosystem. So even, even though these, uh, these fish are potentially you know, very problematic, there are things that we can do to help prevent their entry uh, into, into Canada and their spread in North America. And one of the big things is to know what they look like. And that is why we have this exhibit here, so that people can come and see them up close and, and get a really good look at what they look like live. So there are some key identification features we can look for. A few I can point out here. So for example, we've got some black carp swimming in front of us and a grass carp. We've got our black carp here. This is our grass carp above it. And one thing you'll notice is that these fish do not have barbels, which are whisker-like uh, appendages that sort of are near the corners of their mouth. Uh, so that's one way we can identify them, is we look for the fact that they don't have barbels. Uh, when it comes to grass carp, who's right there uh, in the center of the screen, grass carp have this very dark outline around their scales. Almost looks like someone painted black lines on them uh, around those scales, and it looks like they're covered in X's. And that's another way that we can identify grass carp, is those really defined scales. We can also look at the placement of the eyes. When we look at this big head carp up here, these guys are pretty small, they're just juvenile still. You can see that their eye is placed very low on their head. In fact, it's below the middle line of the body. If you were to draw a straight line from the, the essentially the, the mouth of the fish all the way back to its tail, the, the eye would be below that. And that gives it a characteristic look that I think makes it almost look like it's swimming upside down. And the other thing we can look for is the placement of the mouth. It's also very low on the body. And we can look at other things too, like the shape of the fins <laughs> compared to other uh, species that we have here, uh, in particular the common carp. So it actually has a very different dorsal fin compared to um, our common carp species. So there's a lot of information about how to identify them on the Invasive Species Center website. So definitely check that out. Um, there's lots of different, different things to look for there. And also to be able to identify them as juveniles, very, very young, younger than these fish here. And the reason for that is because as juveniles, they can easily be confused with some of our native minnow species. And they could potentially uh, be found in bait fish which would be a problem. So that leads me to the next thing that we can do to prevent the spread of Asian carp is to know uh, what bait fish you're using and to make sure you're buying any bait fish uh, in the same area where you're going to be doing the fishing. And that helps prevent the spread, not only of Asian carp, but of any aquatic invasive species. So you make sure you buy your bait fish if you're fishing in the same area where you're fishing and also dispose of it in that same area as well. And that helps prevent the spread of, of Asian carp and other invasive species. And finally, there is one more thing we can do. If you were to ever see an Asian carp, or think you saw one, we'll just go over here so I can show you. You can report any sightings of Asian carps right here to the Invading Species Hotline. There's a phone number there, but you can also submit sightings online through edmaps.org slash Ontario. So that's a really good thing to do. Those, uh, all those reports are followed up on uh, so that they can be sure that it was an Asian carp or that it wasn't an Asian carp and they can keep track of any of these sightings. There's a picture of the silver carp jumping right there. If you ever look up a video of it, it's, uh, it's pretty intense behavior. So I wanna thank you very much for joining me today at our Big Bad and Ugly Asian Carp exhibit. And again, if you wanna learn more about Asian carp, you can check out the Toronto Zoo website, specifically on the Great Lakes Program webpage. You can check out Invasive Species Center website, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and the Invading Species Awareness Program as well. So lots of resources out there. So thanks again and enjoy your day.